Imran Khan has a very, very ambitious agenda. Uh, he uh, wants to end corruption. He wants to create an Islamic welfare state. Uh, he wants to uh, resolve the Kashmir problem. As you say, he wants to end the Afghanistan war. He has absolutely no experience in governance. He's never governed anything. So I think he's going to have a very, very tough time. I expect Pakistan, um, which is already a state with numerous problems, is going to be even more beset by problems under Imran Khan than it has been the last 15, 20 years. Uh, Imran Khan is pledging to do a lot as prime minister. He is planning an austerity drive. Um, and he laid all this out in quite a lot of um, detail during his um, inaugural speech as prime minister. However, um, the speech actually gives a little bit of an indication of what his, his priorities are going to be. He is primarily going to focus on domestic policy. But I think, you know, because he is largely untested in national office, um, we don't really know uh, whether or not he will be able to deliver. But he has some people on his team who are, you know, widely considered to be uh, the folks who can help him, uh, help him deliver. I think the Chinese are so deeply involved in Pakistan now. Uh, that they can't afford to walk away from their commitments. Um, they have sunk billions of dollars into trying to build infrastructure in Pakistan, all of which is a good thing. Uh, Pakistan certainly needs infrastructure. Imran Khan has made it very clear since he was elected and during his election campaign that he sees China as Pakistan's most important ally. He wants to emulate the China model, he says. It's a little bit hard to square the China model with creating a Muslim welfare state with a democracy, since China's none of those things except maybe a welfare state. Um, but I think the Chinese will help him out. I think they will, they will do what they can. Uh, I'm worried about the long-term impact of Pakistan becoming so dependent upon China. There, there are a couple of things. You know, Pakistan keeps having uh, a balance of payment. You know, Pakistan's balance of payments crises are recurring events um, because the fundamental institutional structures uh, of the country don't change. So Pakistan is going to the has gone to the IMF more than a dozen times, um, and it is likely that it will be going to the IMF uh, again this year to uh, help bail it out. Um, and the real problem is that Pakistan takes Pakistan's growth is financed through debt. Um, and uh, things look good for a while until Pakistan has to repay that debt. And once uh, you know um, the repayments come sort of blooming, Pakistan um, is, is in a sort of in a balance of payments crisis and what it needs then is further debt to help repay that. So um, you know Khan may you know Imran Khan and his government, Asad Umar, may be able to negotiate a deal with the IMF, though there are some questions about that, given that the IMF, uh, uh, and in particular America, uh, and Secretary of State Pompeo, um, have said that they do not want to um, uh, give um, US aid, in particular, to a country that is basically using US aid to repay China. In any case, I think Pakistan will be able to cobble together enough um, money uh, in order to come out in, of this immediate balance of payments crisis. But in terms of a longer term economic solution, what it really needs is um, institutional changes, you know, a widening uh, tax base, growth that is financed internally, not through external debt. I think there's, there's solid evidence that the army uh, helped uh, Imran Khan's party and intimidated his enemies and intimidated the Pakistani press. The 
what does the army really want out of all of this? Well, I think that they want is a prime minister and a civilian government who leaves their prerogatives alone. It doesn't get involved in the things that matter to them the most, which is a um, the uh, protection of the army and all of its rackets. Hmm. After all, the most corrupt institution in Pakistan is the army. And that's been proven by Pakistani analysts and researchers uh, who've done a superb job of showing how the army uh, is one of the largest land owners in the country. Um, and which runs all kinds of uh, industrial conglomerates um, under various uh, cutouts. Imran Khan's anti-corruption campaign, I predict, is not going to go after the generals. It's not going to go after the army. It's not going to go after their cozy friends. Um, and they want to be in control of the parts of the foreign policy that matter to them the most. And those are the relationship with India, uh, the relationship with organizations like lashkar e taiba uh, relationship with the Afghan Taliban. Um, and of course, they want to control the nuclear weapons programs. If Imran Khan leaves all of that in their hand, they'd be quite happy to let him uh, do whatever he wants to do on other issues, um, pursuing his own political agenda against Nawaz Sharif uh, and the Bhutos. So Khan has denied um, allegations of support from the army. You know, he doesn't like being called uh, the army's favorite. Uh, uh, and whether it was in collusion or whether it wasn't, you know, the, the fact remains that um, the army's meddling with the election did help, uh, did help Khan win. And Khan readily took that, that, that help. Um, so that gives us indications about whether or not um, the army is going to meddle in the government's affairs, in the civilian government's affairs. So two things in that. Um, initially, the army is likely to give him a relatively wide berth uh, in terms of what he can do because um, their objectives are broadly in alignment, not, not entirely, they're broadly in, ali in alignment. However, there are things to note about that, that can set up a clash between Khan and the army. Um, in particular, Khan's um, personality, uh, which is, um, uh, you know, sort of tends to be stubborn, tends to be, he tends to be very independent minded. Um, uh, that may actually set up set up conflict. So the army is likely to stay out of uh, Khan's way domestically. So when it comes to um, when it comes to delivery of social services, governance reform, and so on, um, it is likely to stay out of Khan's way there. And that is really the kind of model it's been following for the last um, five to ten years. Actually, for the last ten years, um, when it comes to foreign policy it will likely continue with the status quo, um, which is that the army is really in charge of security and foreign policy. However, Khan may want to, as he has indicated, um, make some changes on that front, you know, have better relations um, with India and have a mutually balanced relationship with the United States. So as soon as he sort of crosses in some ways a thin red line that they will draw, um, on uh, on his control on security and foreign policy, um, we might start to see trouble, and we might start to see a souring of the relationship. Well, Imran Khan's public remarks on this are, are pretty consistent over time. He he parrots the long-standing Pakistani position that any resolution of India-Pakistan difficulties have to begin with the resolution of the Kashmir dispute. And of course, the resolution of the Kashmir dispute that he has in mind is for um, Kashmir to be handed over to Pakistan, um, either through a, a plebiscite or simply through diplomacy. Now, that's not going to happen. Um, that's a dead end. Um, 
he undoubtedly knows that as well, which means that there is no real serious prospect here for a breakthrough. If you resolve Pakistan's problems with India, why do you need to have the fastest growing nuclear arsenal in the world? Why do you need to have one of the largest armies in the world? Uh, I don't, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't see much prog progress on the um, Pakistani Indian relationship moving forward. In his inaugural speech, you know, he really talked very little about foreign policy. I mean, perhaps 30 seconds on foreign policy. And he just said, you know, we want great relationships with our neighbors. Um, and it's, you know, uh, I, I think his intentions are, are clear on that front. And so the relationship and, and with, um, with Modi's uh, sort of pronouncement, the relationship has started out on a decent footing. However, um, here's the here's the the sort of the the tug of war or the um, the tension uh, in in Khan's priorities versus the India Pakistan relationship. Khan's priorities, at least initially, because of Pakistan's situation uh, currently, because of the economic uh, slash balance of payments crisis, necessarily need to be um, domestic. Um, so his focus in the short term is going to be domestic. However, um, the short term is exactly the time when he will have the widest um, uh, sort of uh, space um, from the army to do what he wants. And the short term is the time where um, he could perhaps really improve relations uh, his, uh, you know, Pakistan's relationship with India. My sense is that things are not really going to change beyond the superficial um, in the short term. And in the medium to long term, we really don't know how his relationship with the army is going to pan out. Um, and hence, we don't know what kind of space he will have to improve the relationship. I think it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, let's leave aside for a moment uh, the peculiarities of Donald Trump uh, and just look at Pakistan and the United States uh, in general. Uh, we have a tortured relationship. Uh, in the past, it was uh, a relationship of great highs and great lows. Uh, it now seems to have moved into a period of one great low followed by an even deeper low. Um, the United States is preoccupied, understandably, with the war in Afghanistan. Pakistan is supporting our enemies. It has been supporting them for 17 years. Um, this administration has been much more willing to say that publicly than any of its predecessors. Imran Khan, on the other hand, has uh, made a career out of attacking the United States, out of attacking the war in Afghanistan. Uh, he refused to condemn Osama bin Laden as a terrorist. He called the Abbottabad raid in 2011 cold-blooded murder. Um, I don't see much room for uh, improvement in relations there. Add all of that, the Donald Trump factor, um, particularly uh, uh, impulsive uh, individual who I don't think has a whole lot of interest in Pakistan. Um, I don't think he has a whole lot of interest in most of the world, but Pakistan in particular doesn't look like it's high on its agenda. I don't see uh, the prospects for any kind of significant improvement in relations between um, Washington and Islamabad. Pakistan State's party um, contested elections not as uh, the Milli Muslim League, which was really Hafiz Said's party, but as another party, uh, which was sort of a, a fringe party, the AAT, the Allah Akbar Tehreek, um, which was a fringe party, but the Milli Muslim, because the Milli Muslim League was banned from contesting elections by the Election Commission of Pakistan, um, the candidates actually went um, under the banner of the other party to contest elections. Um, it did poorly. It, and and uh, that is that is really no surprise. Um, obviously, given um, the the fact that it was known before the election that um, uh, the the candidates from the Milli Muslim League had been subsumed 
under another party, the Election Commission should have banned the other party from contesting them. Um, that it did not really points to, you know, partly a, a failure on its part and partly perhaps, you know, time constraints. So we can perhaps let this one pass for this time. It will really remain to be seen whether or not um, it does so in the future. I mean, basically, these candidates who, you know, who um, contested against, uh, contested under the banner of the Million Muslim League, those candidates need to be banned, whichever party they're running from, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's that's sort of one thing. Um, obviously, it's a very worrisome development in the short term, and it was a very worrisome um, thing to have candidates from the Million Muslim League. Uh, you know, running under a different party's banner in the in the short term, but because they didn't they didn't amass any sort of any significant number of votes, you know, one can sort of wait and see in some ways, you know, what kinds of um, rules and policies uh, it follows the election commission of Pakistan follows the next time around. I think what is more worrisome is the mainstreaming of um, fundamentalist parties, not necessarily parties with terror links. I feel like Pakistan will cut down. Uh, on, on on those um, uh, perhaps because of external pressure, uh, uh, even if even if the incentives aren't there politically locally to do so, but it does so because of external pressure. The problem is that there isn't really external pressure to to um, to uh, eliminate parties with fundamentalist links from running. Uh, for election, and there certainly are domestic incentives in Pakistan to let those parties run. And in particular, I'm talking about the TLP, the Tehrik e Bank Pakistan, um, which is a party that, um, which was sort of a, a group uh, and, and, and then became a political party um, that basically um, runs, ran on and whose policy platform is the upholding and the implementation of Pakistan's blasphemy. And that party, um, uh, you know, while uh, their links with violence are um, not as well formed, obviously, as the links of Lashkar Taiba with violence, um, is an extremist party. Um, and that party, while it did not win any seats in the um, in the national election, did win uh, provincial assembly seats and did well in the overall vote count, uh, amassing you know, about 2 million votes uh, across the, the country out of 50 some million. And, and so that really is a worrisome development and points to a mainstreaming of extremist parties um, that uh, points to a failure on the part of the Election Commission of Pakistan to regulate them and, and points to um, the fact that these parties have some resonance. Extremist parties do have some resonance. And so really, I think the key going forward will be to see whether or not um, the Election Commission can, can uh, you know, make sure that no candidates with links to, to terror, regardless of which party platform they're contesting from, will run. And um, to see what they do about extremist parties, because having the rhetoric of these parties, um, of extremist parties in the mainstream has consequences.